you know, we got through 1998, we got through the dot-com crash, we got through 2008, we got through 2020 and COVID. Uh, there was a, actually a good size uh, market drawdown in 2018 between October 1st, 2018 uh, and Christmas Eve, what I call the Christmas Eve massacre. Stock markets dropped 20% in, uh, in under three months uh, when the Fed kept raising interest rates, even though the economy was weakening. So they have seen those, but every single time it came back, even in COVID, uh, March, April, 2020, the stock market went down 30%. It did, I mean, just almost straight down. But by September, we were back to new all-time highs. And so it's not that they've never seen that kind of volatility, but they learned the wrong lesson, which is it always comes back. And we know why, because the Fed bails you out, the Fed floods the zone with money, the Fed talks it up, you know, et cetera. But the, the counter example, 1929, when the stock market did crash, it was down 23% over two days. It was like a 12% day and an 11% day in uh, late October, 1929 but it kept going. <laughs> the stock market crashed in October, 1929, but it bottomed in June, 1932. That was a three year moving crash or rolling crash, whatever you want to call it, with some rallies along the way. And the total uh, damage was over 80%, not 30%, not 40%, down 80%. And what people don't know, uh, many people don't know, is you said, okay, you know, then, then it rallied in 1933, 1934, the Fed messed up again and blundered again, as they usually do in 1937, and threw us into a double dip. But if you ask people, okay, well, everyone knows the stock market crashed in 1929. When did it regain those highs? How long did that take? The answer is 25 years. It was 1954 before right. the market recovered from 1929. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't gains along the way or you couldn't make money, you could. But if you say, oh, I'll just sit tight and wait till it comes back. Well, a lot of people didn't live long enough. They never saw their, their money back because they didn't live 25 more years. So that's a real bear market. It's happened before. And the, the point is uh, you need to be prepared for things like that. And there are no one alive, but very few people alive have have seen anything like that. And if you say, well, what if we had another market crash right now? We'll talk about reasons why in a second. Um, why could the Fed just come right back in and you know print some more money and do the same thing over again and bail out the new failures, whatever they may be? Yeah, you, know, you can just kind of keep bailing things out. Why not do it again? You know, what's the what's the big deal? Well, the answer is each bailout is bigger than the one before. And that's the point. You can go all the way back 1994, Mexico, 1998, Russia, LTCM, 2000, dot com, 2008, Lehman, 2020, pandemic. And they do bail out, but each one's bigger than the one before. I mean, we threw out six or seven trillion dollars of new debt on top of a one trillion dollar a year baseline, seven trillion dollars in new debt to kind of dig our way out of uh, of 2020. So there is a there is a limit. There comes a time it's like, hey, this this bail is going to be 20 trillion you know sorry that's uh, that checks too big we're gonna have to let some things fail so what could happen um the the first thing on my list is uh we're heading for a very uh severe recession i just want to kind of explain briefly the dynamics of that so the feds raising interest rates we know that they started you know it, so it wasn't that long ago but march 1st 2022 the fed policy rate was zero it was zero percent uh, people remember Paul Walker. Oh, Paul Walker raised interest rates to 20%. Well, he did, but so far Powell hasn't raised them as high, but he's raised them fast. I mean, even when Volcker was working his way to 20%, it took three years from 1979 to 1982. So Powell's plan is clear because he's told us. He said inflation is job one. You know, it's not that we don't care, but unemployment is going to go up. We're going to have a recession. He doesn't use the R word, by the way, but it's implicit in everything he says. We are going to have a recession. Unemployment is going up. And too bad. It's kind of too bad because we got to get inflation under control. And so the Fed is in search of something that they call the terminal rate. What's the terminal rate? The terminal rate is a rate that's high enough to bring inflation down on its own without further hikes. So it doesn't have to be higher than inflation. It has to be high enough 
to cause inflation to come down to the Fed's goal of 2% without hiking more. And when they get there to that terminal rate, they'll sit tight, they call it the pause. And the pause could be a year. And Powell said this, again, this is right out of his script. So um, Powell's in search of the terminal rate. By the way, if you said to me, hey Jim, what's the terminal rate? I would answer truthfully, I would say, I don't know, but neither does Jay Powell. Jay Powell doesn't know what the terminal rate is. He's, he's kind of saying, we'll know it when we see it, but we're not there yet and we're gonna keep going. And um, they, they have what they call the DOTS, silly name, but the members of the Board of Governors and the Federal Reserve Bank presidents give estimates or the, you know, their estimates of unemployment, inflation, growth, and interest rates for the next three years. Uh, and they put them as dots on a chart, so they call it the dots. Uh, and then, you know, Wall Street gets the dots, they do a central tendency and regressions and all this stuff. One of the top Fed insiders, like, practically sits in Jay Powell's lap and has, all the way back to Bernanke and Yellen, told me personally, he said, inside the Fed, they regard the dots as a joke. They're not better than guesses. Their forecasting ability is dismal. You or I would have better forecasts. And they wish they could get out of it, but they don't know how. So that's the truth, but the problem is, Wall Street and the financial media and the talking heads on CNBC, they want to talk about the dots and it does affect market behavior. So even though it's a joke, even though the forecasts are terrible, you have to pay attention because it affects the markets. And if you're affecting the markets, you're on the wrong side, you're going to get run over. So I look at the dots, not because I put weight on them as predictive analytic tools, but because the market pays attention. The market says, hey, inflation is already coming down. And so the market says, hey, you did it. You're, you know, you're already there. Inflation is coming down. Why don't you stop? And by the way, you're going to get the message. The economy is going to be slowing down. Inflation is going to be coming down. And then you're going to cut rates. This is the famous pivot. Whenever you hear of the Fed pivot, that's when the Fed turns around and starts cutting rates instead of raising them. And that'll be just in time and growth will slow, but it won't be too bad. And we'll come in for soft landing. And this is the Goldilocks scenario. Uh, so again, typical Wall Street, get the pom-poms out, the Fed's going to cut rates, and so buy stocks. That's all Wall Street knows is buy stocks. But the conundrum is, is inflation coming down because the Fed is still hiking, or is the inflation coming down because they're at the terminal rate? Well, we don't know. It's kind of hard to sort those things out. Powell would say, yeah, it's coming down. I know that, of course, but I got it's, it's because I'm hiking and I'm going to keep doing it. My view is, no, you you actually did it. It's mission accomplished. You just don't know it. That means, as usual, they're going to screw it up. They're going to blunder. They're going to go too far. And it's not going to be a mild recession. It's not going to be Goldilocks. In this version, Goldilocks gets eaten by the bears. In other words, you're going to throw this economy into a very deep recession because you're going to go too far, as usual. And you're not going to know it until too, too late. By the time you realize You've, it's mission accomplished, you will have gone too far, too long, rates are going to be too high, and it's not going to be a soft landing. If Wall Street's talking up the stock market based on the soft landing Goldilocks scenario, but Powell's going to stick to his guns and, and, and raise rates too high, that's going to cause stocks to crash very severely, very suddenly. If, if the market were adjusting, say, yeah, Powell means it, uh, he's going to keep it, man, we ought to come down a little bit, that would be one thing, but that's not what's happening. The market's trying to rally, Powell's warning people what's going to happen they're not listening and it is going to happen people hear the government say you know the economy's fine or you know unemployment's near an all-time low which is actually statistically is is true and they, they kind of nod and go yeah it's all good and then reality is the stuff that hits you in the head like a two by four you know the propaganda is um positive we can talk about that in a little more detail the reality is harsh um and reality wins um and there's a very good book um, on this um, by Robert Schiller, a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist at Yale University. I'm not a huge fan of your garden variety PhD economist, but there are some good ones out there and he's one of them. He wrote a book about, oh, two years ago, maybe a little bit less called Narrative Economics. Uh, he said, yeah, you've got all the models and uh, Phillips curve and uh, wealth effect and uh, uh, you know, various you know, quantity theory of money. And you know, some have a place, some are more valuable than others. But uh, don't underestimate the power of a narrative. A narrative is a story. It's basically a, it's a fancy name for a story, but a story that, that persists, that grows. Uh, and interestingly, in epidemiology, of course, we've just come through a pandemic. There's a model called the SEIR model that stands for susceptible. Are you susceptible to a virus? E for exposed. Are you exposed to it? 
I, are you infected? Did you get it? And R, did you recover? Um, the difference between I and R are people who died. But it's, it's a model and it's mathematically based and it's empirically validated of how viruses spread exponentially. And you can also use it to forecast how a virus is going to go. Well, what Schiller did, he took that model, moved it over to economics um, and took a narrative kind of like a virus, not in a negative sense, but just to something that spreads. And uh, it can be very powerful and then eventually may die out in reverse, but it can be powerful in the meantime. Um, that much I knew, but what I learned from the book that I hadn't really thought about is that narratives don't have to be true. They can be true and they can be very powerful, but a narrative can be false and still be powerful. If it's the self-fulfilling prophecy, if enough people believe it, it sort of becomes the reality to some extent, even if it's based on false premises. He gives an example during the Great Depression. The Great Depression really was two technical recessions, but there was a period from 1929 to 1933, election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Then there was another period from 1933 to 1937. The 37 to 1940 part, we we'll leave aside for this purpose. But during the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time. But it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are, have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because is precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of the depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not going to spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Now, when FDR came along, 19, was elected in 1933, became president in 1934, the psychology turned 180 degrees and all of a sudden, you know, the, the Democratic campaign saw always happy days are here again. And you know, FDR seemed to solve the banking crisis and so forth. And all of a sudden it became okay to spend money. Well, in the middle of the Great Depression, 1934 to 1936, those were some of the strongest years ever for the stock market. And unemployment did come down a lot. Now, the problem is it came down from like 25% to 15%. Well, 15% is still you know painfully high, but it was a, a big move in the right direction. So he, he describes how the narrative flip from don't spend money, it's poor form to, yeah, go spend money and help the economy. None of that is taught in, in business school. It's not taught in economics. It can be modeled using this epidemiology model, but it doesn't fit into any of the standard uh, macroeconomic models, but it's powerful stuff. And so today what's going on is that the White House is trying to push a narrative and they're failing badly, but they'll say, if you listen to the deliberations among White House officials, you know, some of the stuff leaks to the press and some, I know some of these people, it's like the economy's great, unemployment's really low, um, it, it's we've created all these jobs since the pandemic, but we're doing a really bad job of messaging. The point is they're inside the White House, they're frustrated that the positive economic story is not getting out. The, the correct analysis is that there is no positive economic story. The economy is in terrible shape. The problem is not the messaging, it's the message. Uh, you, and this is why I say the propaganda from the White House of things are great is at odds with the reality, which is things are not great. Let me give you some specific data points, because as I say, I don't like to make statements like this without backing it up. Number one, the inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, the, if everything, is great until February 27th, and then Russia invades, and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up. All right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This this inflation goes back to uh, late 2021. It was persistent in the fall. We all remember the Fed and the Treasury saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And then finally, I think Jay Powell was testifying before Congress. He said, it's time to retire the word transitory. So that was his way of throwing in the towel. And Janet Yellen admitted she was mistaken also. Um, so it predates the war, number one. Number two, oh, gee, energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, uh, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason uh, is not because Putin invaded Ukraine. It's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? 
he closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada into the United States, where it would connect at a hub, uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada. Then uh, ended new leasing, uh, oil and gas exploration leasing of federal lands, handicapped the fracking industry, took a number of other steps using environmental tools, climate alarm, government subsidies, etc., to basically, to the extent possible, shut down the U.S. energy industry as much as possible. Now, you can't shut down completely, of course, but everything happens at the margin. And then we end up with you know, oil prices doubling or tripling, really, from $40 to $120. In, in under a year, which is comparable to what happened in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo. And then Biden wakes up and says, huh, guess we need more oil. And uh, he, so he wants to reopen leasing. I said they shut down. They did, but he wants to reopen it. He's begging Saudi Arabia to pump more. Saudi Arabia is kind of not returning his phone calls. He's begging Venezuela to pump more. Oh, great. The greatest pariah dictator in the Western Hemisphere. And we're begging him for oil. So why don't we drill our own oil? Because uh, we were a net exporter up until 2021. And then Biden came in. We lost that edge and became a net importer, including recently buying oil from Russia. They curtailed that for political reasons, but that's kind of where we got to. Uh, so you wonder why the price of energy is going up. In other words, this damage was self-inflicted. But don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and the inflation in the U.S. has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer of electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now, that's another fantasy. It, it won't happen. I could, we don't have time to go through all the physics of it. Uh, and, you know, output of energy by weight, com gasoline compared to batteries and the pollution of batteries and the fact that, you, you know, you, you got to, we don't have the charging stations. And even if we did, where's that electricity coming from? Oh, coal. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the U.S. economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen. Another example of propaganda versus reality. You know, narratives are pow powerful, but reality is more powerful. We're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming, we're in it. It's a triple, greatest bubble of all time, times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks, and, and other asset classes. The largest, most sophisticated, biggest player, real money, market in the world is telling you that the Fed's going to blink, that they're going to raise rates, but then things are going to get so bad, they're going to have to cut rates. And that's why we can see a liquidity crisis and a very severe recession coming well in advance. I haven't really seen the real, the, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out and it'll get worse as the year goes on. Inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, if everything is great until February 27th and then Russia invades and then all of a sudden inflation goes up. All right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This this inflation goes back to uh, late 2021. It was persistent in the fall. We all remember the Fed and the Treasury saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And then finally, J. Powell was testifying for Congress. He said, it's time to retire the word transitory. So that was his way of throwing in the towel. And Johnny Yellen admitted she was mistaken also. This is going to be part of what throws the economy into a severe recession. They're raising rates and inflation is coming down. But what they don't know is, are interest rates coming down because they're raising rates? Or have they already hit the terminal rate and it's coming down on its own and they just don't know it? And that's a big deal because if they're at the terminal rate and they just don't know it and they keep tightening, which they are, they are going to over tighten, probably already have. The energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, uh, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason uh, is not because Putin invaded Ukraine, it's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president. 
and then went back to the White House. So it was the first thing he did. He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada into the United States, where it would connect at a hub, uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada. And then we end up with oil prices doubling or tripling, really from $40 to $120 in, in under a year. The other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off, or there's an embargo, or there's a shortage, of natural disaster, a lot of things. It's coming from the supply side, and demand is inelastic, so you just pay up or you know kind of do without. Um, but the demand side is much more psychological. That's called uh, demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described, and as I said, I lived through the '70s. Um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So inflation is coming down, no question. But is it because the Fed has continued to raise rates or is it because the Fed has hit a terminal rate and all they have to do is nothing, just pause, as they put it, and inflation will come down where they want? Uh, the market believes we're at the terminal rate. The Fed should just stop right now, leave it alone. Sooner than later, pivot to, uh, that's the new buzzword, pivot to rate cuts. And it's the anticipation of those rate cuts that has Wall Street all spun up. They get the pom-poms out and saying, buy stocks, buy tech, because the Fed's going to cut rates. The Fed does not see it that way at all. Um, the Fed says, um, yeah, we're raising rates. Inflation's coming down, but we're not at the terminal rate. We'll kind of know when we see it, but they think it's probably five and a quarter. That's a very good estimate based on what the Fed has said themselves. I started my career uh, in banking in 1976. And uh, so I started, I remember my uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking. And the inflation was so bad, you'd get a raise every like four or five months. And you didn't have to ask, they would just give it to you because they knew that you were gonna quit if, if, if uh, they didn't keep up. So she would get a raise and she was making more than I was at the time. So we'd go out to dinner and then I would get a raise and I was making more than she was. So we would just tease each other about that. But that's how it was. Um, and the psychology was, you know, if you needed a whatever, you know, TV set or refrigerator, new car, whatever, you say, I better buy it now because the price is gonna be higher. If I wait a month or two months, the price is gonna run away from me. So it, it had huge behavioral uh, effects. Between 77 and 81, so that five year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power, not 15, 50. During the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time. But it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, or buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of the depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not going to spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, and mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course, they're related. You know, it's like, I was like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You, to get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Oh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food, you got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That requires diesel, the higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. Um, but, but food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So, so you have that, um, that, that cost push inflation. We're not quite at the stage where it's demand pull. We're not quite at the stage where individual consumers are behaving the way I described in the 1970s saying, hey, better better spend the money fast because it's it's losing value. This damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, 
The price increase and in inflation in the U.S. has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer of electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now that's another fantasy. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the US economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen. I'd rather be the U.S. than China. China's in even worse shape for different reasons. Um, it's not so much interest rate policy, although they're they're subject to global interest rate policy and exchange rates coming from the Fed. But uh, you can see it in real estate. It's a full scale collapse. Uh, they're they're propping it up, but um, the 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 buyers aren't interested. In other words, the the Chinese government is telling the banks to lend money to real estate developers who can't finish housing. Well, that sounds good. It's like, okay, here's some money, finish the housing. But the buyers are not flocking in. The buyers have been burned. They're shying away from that asset class. They want to increase cash. They're looking at other asset classes. They don't have a lot of choices because China has very strict capital controls. They're trying to get their money out by means legal and illegal. Uh, they're buying gold when they can. Um, but uh, as I say, they may not have a lot of choices, but even money in the bank looks pretty good compared to what's going on in real estate. The problem is too big. The bubble is too large. It's gone on for too long. We don't hear about it the same way we did about the Japanese real estate bubble in 1989, 1990. That was an epic crash. Uh, Japan is still not recovered. I remember in the 90s, early 2000s, they talked about the lost decade. Well, try three lost decades. That's going into a fourth. Uh, that's Japan, you know, eight or I've lost count, actually, eight or nine recessions since 1989. But it's really just one long depression. That's the way to understand the Japanese economy. China's going into something like that. We don't hear much about it because they're not transparent. They lie about their numbers. You, you need to look at private sources and other use other, other analytic tools to understand what's going on there. Uh, but they've got um, you know, drops in consumption, industrial output, real estate's collapsing, uh, their price indices are collapsing, all this infl fear of inflation. It's been around, it's real, but it's now turning around very quickly. And you can see that in China. China's gone through something that the world has never seen. Uh, it is a, they're going to lose 600 million people in the next 50 to 70 years. This is a demographic implosion. This is worse than the Black Death. Of course, the Black Death uh, killed somewhere between a third and half the population of Europe in the uh, 14th century. Um, uh, it was a good time for uh, for labor, by the way. Uh, the you know the labor was so scarce that returns to labor went up versus returns to capital uh, because there weren't enough workers. Uh, but that's the only thing uh, that can come close. Even the uh, you know the Spanish flu of 1919 killed about no no one's certain of the number, but but between 100 million and maybe over 200 million people. The Thirty Years' War was certainly you know in the early 17th century was certainly highly destructive. But what's going on in China now is is worse than any of those things. Um, you know it has to do with math, you know, simple demographic math. Uh, the key number is 2.1. Two people have to produce 2.1 children, you know, man and woman, or you can say per woman if you if you want, uh, have to produce 2.1 children to keep the population constant. Why not two? Why not two producing two? The answer is infant mortality and those who don't make it to uh, adulthood and can continue the uh, repopulation of the planet, uh, if you will. But they're not even close to that. They're well below two. And by the way, so is so is the rest of the world. So is Australia and the US and Western Europe and a lot of other places. This is a global phenomenon, but it's particularly acute in China. Maybe the case that China's uh, replacement rate is, uh, or, or birth rate is actually one. Uh, it has to be 2.1 to maintain. It could be one or lower. Uh, this is a, a demographic implosion, unlike anything ever seen, uh, anyone's ever seen. It also has a dynamic. You can't reverse it very quickly. It, it feeds on itself as uh, I was talking about inflation earlier. So, uh, this is going to continue for 50 to 75 years. Uh, they're going to lose 600 million people. There are a lot of definitions of GDP, a four or five part definition. They're more complex calculations, but there's one really simple definition. It only has two factors. 
population and productivity. How many people are working and how productive are they? That's nominal GDP. It's, that's one definition of gross GDP uh, or, or nominal uh, GDP. Well, if your population is dropping from 1.4 billion to 800 million, you're losing 600 million people. Uh, and then what about productivity? Well, the other thing that's going on is China's population is aging very quickly. So you get a population of set people in the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, with very large amounts of um, cognitive decline, dementia. Uh, obviously, there's no productivity there, but it's worse than that because then you look at the shrinking population between the ages of 25 and 54. It's called their prime working age. More and more of those people are going to have to be involved in elder care. They're going to have to be basically caretakers or caregivers for the older population I described. A very worthy job, but not one that lends itself to productivity gains. Um, bathing hasn't changed in about 5,000 years. Robots don't do best. Um, the only real innovation in bathing in uh, between 1870 and 1940, we did see the rise of indoor plumbing and hot water. That's good. Um, I, I enjoy both, but um, but that's it. We, I can't think of any other bathing innovations uh, in, in the last several millennia. So if you have a shrinking working age population, a rising older population, high degree of cognitive decline, and a big slice of the working age population having to provide elder care or be caregivers for the older population. Tell me where your industrial output's coming from. Tell me where your productivity is coming from. And uh, sorry if I mentioned this already, but 50% of the water in China is poisoned uh, because of, you know, just their industrial practices. You know, they, they uh, if you're a gold miner in Australia, I invest in gold mines around the world. I know that places like Canada, the U.S. and uh, Australia, if you use cyanide, to leach the gold, and that's a very common technique. You have to account for every, you know, microgram. You, you know, whatever you put in, you got to take out, weigh it, dispose of it properly. In China, they just dump it into the rivers, and so the rivers are poisoned. Um, so China is uh, uh, an economic, demographic, industrial, moral, religious uh, wasteland, and uh, will suffer. It's it's already in a recession. Just to just to cut to the chase. Again, they lie about their statistics. So, so here you have the two largest economies in the world, U.S. and China. U.S. is slowly going into what I expect will be a severe recession. China is in a century-long decline, uh, unlike one that the world has ever seen. Um, that could eventually lead to social unrest and regime change, but let's not count on that in the short run. Just expect China to um, to shrink and become more autarkic, decoupled from the Western world, and uh, certainly not be a, a source of growth. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the largest and most sophisticated semiconductor manufacturing in the world. And semiconductors are in everything. It's not just computers. There are 1,400 semiconductors in an automobile. Uh, there's a semiconductor or more in your, your dishwasher, your refrigerator, your washing machine. They're everywhere. Internet of things. We all understand that. Um, so TSMC based in Taiwan. Uh, the United States has a military doctrine called the broken nest theory. And what it says is that if China, well, it comes from a Chinese proverb, ironically, and it says, if the nest is broken, how can the eggs survive? Um, and what it means is that if China invades Taiwan, and I'm not forecasting invasion, could happen though, um, we or the Taiwanese will very quickly destroy all the semiconductor manufacturers in Taiwan. We'll just blow them up. And China won't get anything. They'll have the broken nest. Taiwan Semiconductor knows this. Um, they talk to the U.S. intelligence and military. Global economy is is the big topic. That's what we all care about most. But financial markets can come up with their own narratives and go their own way, at least for a while. So you have to, they're not in, in sync. They, they do, they will be in sync eventually, but uh, not always right away. A lot of times the financial markets get ahead of themselves and then they wake up to reality and they, oh, crash, you know, correct down. So there's a little bit of that going on. But in terms of the global economy, um, I think your use of the word global is very, much on point because we are going into or may already be in a global recession. Now that's rare. It's it's rare when hey, China, Japan, U.S., Germany, they're all in recession at the same time. But that's what's 
unfolding. That's a big deal. Uh, well, for obvious reasons, uh, because, uh, you know, it affects uh, basically everyone, but, um, there's no life preserver. There's no, you know, it's not like China's going to pull us all out of it with cheap exports or, or Japan's going to, you know, put the pedal to the metal in terms of fixed, uh, asset investment, uh, you know, et cetera. So, so that's a really bad sign. I mean, and just to be very specific, you know, we just saw U.S. Fourth quarter GDP grew at a 2.9% annualized rate. People are like, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, and you know, it's not good by post 1980 standards. It's not good at all by post World War II standards, but post 2008, yeah, that's not, that's not bad. Uh, again, you have to disaggregate it and you look at what grew. It was uh, inventories were a big contributor, uh, and net exports were a big contributor. Um, and a fi- fixed asset investment in particular, there was a big, load of um, uh, aircraft orders for Boeing, which is notoriously lumpy. You know, they, they'll have a big month, blowout month, and then nothing for a couple of months, not nothing, but, you know, s- something very low. So when you look at that, uh, inventories are counted as part of GDP, of course, but it's not necessarily a good thing. If inventories are piling up, it means retailers are not buying. And this kind of goes back to the whole supply chain breakdown of a year ago. It's what my book sold out was about. So you go back to, uh, let's say, the spring of 2022. The supply chain had completely fallen apart. And if you were a purchasing manager and you were, you were saying to yourself, um, okay, we're kind of coming out of COVID. We're, we're, we're going to start growing. Uh, but the supply chain is broken. So instead of ordering one, you know, container, I'm going to order three containers because maybe one will get through, you know, through the bottlenecks. I only want one, but I'm going to order three and hope for the best. What happened was some of that, a lot of the stuff was alleviated, not for good reasons, not really for logistical reasons, but because the consumers slowed down a lot beginning in June, partly in reaction to the Fed starting to hike rates in March of uh, 2022. Uh, and then here come the three containers. So at this, at the, at the exact moment when uh, demand destruction is kicking in, your inventory is going to the rafters. So what do retailers do or wholesalers for that matter? But retail, they slash prices that, you know, two for one sales, uh, you know, because inventories are a nightmare for retailers for obvious reasons. Number one, you have to finance them. So they eat up working capital. It could be cash, but now you know, you got a bunch of stuff in the back office. And number two, it just takes up space. I mean, it, it insurance costs and, and other costs like that. But the other thing people kind of underestimate is that like st- uh, fashion goes, stuff goes out of fashion. You know, ne- last spring's styles are not next spring styles. You still got last spring stuff. Good luck. You know, it's, it, we're getting close to spring. So you're dumping that stuff. Um, you know, consumer electronics, uh, you know, you got an iPhone 13, well, everybody wants an iPhone 14, you know, whatever. I mean, you take the point. So, um, so piling up inventories is a very unhealthy sign. It means the retail sector is drying up, demand destruction is kicking in, costs are going up because you got to finance all this stuff and your profit margins are going down. So I don't take a lot of comfort from that. But the other thing, to the extent you can disaggregate monthly data, and there's a lot of monthly data, yeah, 2.9% annualized for the quarter, but it really slowed down in December. Christmas was a disaster. I mean, yeah, people bought stuff for Christmas, but way below expectations. And again, it goes back to piling up the inventory at the worst possible time. So it looks like the U.S. is going into 2023. Possibly recession started in December. If not, we expect it to start soon. But you're seeing the same thing in Europe now. Europe got a break with the weather. Uh, you know, obviously there's a war going on, so that's a big factor. But, um, uh, you know, and natural gas prices, uh, skyrocketed and, uh, and, and oil prices skyrocketed, um, again in mid, uh, 2022. They've come down, but it doesn't mean that, you know, all is well or, or they're out of the woods and there are, there are other things going on. China is a basket case. Um, you know, they went from zero COVID. It was bad public policy and bad health policy. But they did it anyway. So they flipped almost on a dime. So they just turned on a dime and said, okay, let it rip. The, the positive letter, okay, let everyone get infected and we'll do the best we can. One of the ways you get through it is by letting it rip and you develop what's called herd immunity. And that's what worked in North America and Europe. But the other difference with, between China and Europe and, and the U.S. is that they don't have the healthcare system to deal with it. Our healthcare system, which is pretty good, was strained. Same thing in Europe. China has nowhere near the ICU unit, the ICU units, the oxygen, the treatments, uh, the, just the, the professionals, the nurses and doctors, not even close. And when you get out to the village level, which is where most of the people still live, believe it or not, um, they, uh, they often have nothing. But that is hurting the economy as much as the zero COVID. They're, they're, they had no good ways out. I'm not saying one's better than the other. They're both awful, but, uh, 
But you still have a lot of things that are not COVID. The real estate collapse, the excessive debt, the demographic decline, um, just the impact of top-down management when you can't possibly get everything right, you know. And so, and decoupling from the U.S. and the U.S. cutting off, um, you know, high-tech exports to China, including third country exports where they're relying on U.S. licenses or equipment. So China's in a deep hole, probably in a recession. Japan, same thing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. And I see a much more severe recession. Now, the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and, uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality. What's actually happening? Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then, uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm a storyteller here, but, um, what I see is, is a kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay. They're, they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened. They probably are at the, um, so-called terminal rate. They just don't know it. They're going to keep going for the reasons I explained. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. Um, and they may pivot, uh, to say that there could be a rate cut. Um, it won't be in April, but you know, rate cut in August, maybe I wouldn't rule that out, but for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to, then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened. On uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre and after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they, they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the, the supply chain was breaking down before COVID. Now, of course, COVID made it worse. Yes. Uh, and the war in Ukraine made it worse, yes. But this really started with Trump's trade war in 2018. That, like I said, there's a thread that runs through all these things. So not to throw out my hands, I'm not going to do that. But when you ask me that, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, you want know, to talk about China, Ukraine, supply chain, Biden, they're all a big deal. You know, in terms of tragedy, probably the war in Ukraine is the most important because it's highly, highly significant economically and strategically. But of course, it's a human tragedy going with it. You know, if Chinese real estate implodes, okay, there's some hardship here and there, but it's not like people being killed or maimed or forced into refugee status. And that is part of what's going on in Ukraine. So that's a, that's probably the biggest single one, but I wouldn't miss the fact that all these things are going on at once. The number one question, uh, cause everyone's concerned about inflation, but there's a big backstory there. But I always say when it comes to your own money, everybody has a PhD in economics. You don't need Larry Summers to tell you what's going on with your budget and your you know, ability to feed your family or keep a roof over your head. So people get inflation. One of the reasons it's so politically toxic is because it's unavoidable. You can't fudge it. You can't spin it. It's like, hey, if I used to fill up my Ford F-150 truck for 50 bucks, and now it's 125 bucks, A, you get it. It's right in your face. And B, that's 75 bucks that you don't have to take your spouse out to dinner, you know, buy a new jacket or whatever. So there's kind of demand destruction at the same time you're spending more money on the one thing you can't do without. So people get it. But then from there, the question I get the most is, hey, Jim, is this going to cause a recession? Are we going to have a recession? 
And as recently as a few months ago, I would say, yeah, I think so. You can see it coming late this year, early next year. Now I say we're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. And there's data. I, you know, I never make statements like that, Brian, without supporting it. So the standard definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. There are a few more bells and whistles having to do with unemployment and a few other things, but that's the rule of thumb. So based on that, based on the best available estimate for a second quarter, likely to be accurate, we're in a recession today. Now, it's not severe, but that's like saying, you know, I'm in bed with a, you know, pneumonia, but I'm not dying. Well, okay, but uh, we're in a recession right now. Um, and there's a lot of whistling past the graveyard. I mean, the stock market is still you know, greatly overpriced. There's still, you know, the buy the dips mentality hasn't gone away. It's still there. You got people like Jim Cramer yelling, you know, buy Netflix or whatever. And, uh, you know, there's institutional support. There's momentum trading. Of course, 95% of the trading is by robots. So you got to reverse engineer the 27 year olds from Bangladesh who don't get out much. They're the ones really writing these algorithms. I mean, brilliant engineers, but, you know, you'd have to show them around Wall Street. So all that's going on. So we haven't really seen the real, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out. It'll get worse as the year goes on. All right. So you're expecting a major correction in stock markets on yeah, the back I'm of not recession. alone. I mean, that is my expectation. I have my own models and I look at it closely. But if you listen to you know, Michael Berry, Jeremy Grantham, uh, you know, Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they run, you know, hundreds of billions and uh, they're saying the same thing. So every now and then someone will throw some statistic at me. And I go, well, how long is your time series? And I go, oh, we took it back five years. I was like, you know, talk to me if you've done it for a hundred years, because that's a little more meaningful. But Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world, you know, 1929, US, 1989, Japan, 2000, dot com stocks, you know, and many others. And he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's real estate, stocks, and other asset classes. So, uh, yeah, I do, that is my view, but it's shared by a number of other analysts. And that would mean like S&P coming off another 20, 30 percent? Yes. And again, you have to remind people, 1929, everyone's like, yeah, October, uh, I think the 18th or 19th, it was late October 1929, the stock market fell 22 percent in two days. It wasn't one day, it was, you know, it was like 12 percent one day, 11 percent the next day, so 23 percent over two days. But that wasn't the crash. I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. This Dow Jones fell 82 percent from top to bottom. Now it took three years. It bottomed in uh, June 1932, started in October 1929, so not quite three years, but that fell 82%. And that happens. So uh, yeah, we're down, uh, you know, NASDAQ's down, uh, bounced back a little bit in recent days, down close to 30%, down the S&P down over 20%. We're in bear market territory, but that's just the beginning. That's not what a full bear market, full you know, market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that I expect. Talk to me about inflation, because, you know, I was looking at some of the inflation numbers and you have to go back to the 80s to see anything that's approaching double digit. You know, I remember being just a kid hearing about double digit inflation. I could kind of remember the gas pumps, you know, the lines at the gas. It's like a distant memory of me in the 70s. And but, you know, how do you talk to younger people these days about what inflation is or it means? Because I don't think people really grasp what it actually means to your savings or to the economy in an, even a medium term. Well, that's exactly right, Brian. And if you, um, you're a little younger than I am, but I lived through it. I was started my career in banking in 1976. And I remember my, uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking. And the inflation was so bad, you'd get a raise every like four or five months. And you didn't have to ask. They would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if they didn't keep up. So she would get a raise and she was making more than I was at the time. So we'd go out to dinner and, and I would get a raise and I was making more than she was. So we would just tease each other about that. But that's how it was. And the psychology was, you know, if you needed a whatever, you know, a TV set or refrigerator, new car, whatever, you say, I better buy it now because the price is going to be higher. If I wait a month or two months, the price is going to run away from me. So it had huge behavioral effects. Of course, gold was, you know, going to the moon. There was a lot going on at the time. But Brian, you're right when you say 
we're putting up inflation numbers today that are the highest in 40 years. That is correct. A little 41, actually, it was 1981 before we saw these numbers. But I remind people, the inflation in 1981 was the end of a 10-year period of inflation. It wasn't the beginning. It's like, oh, that's some inflation in 1981. Yeah, we did, but it had started. I mean, in some ways it started in 1968 and it really took off in 1974, 75. So 81, these numbers, that was when Volcker finally got it under control. But you go back to 80, you now 70, we do well, between 77 and 81, so that five-year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power, not 15, 50 in that five-year stretch. So you were putting up numbers, you know, 10%, 11%, 13% and higher year after year. Yeah, 1981, it was, um, you know, nine or 10, which is what they're comparing it to today. But that was on the downslope. It had been higher than that in 77, 78, and you know, 79. So the question is, is this the beginning of an inflationary surge where it's going to get even worse and it is going to last five years? Or is it different than that? But keep that in mind because the 40-year comparison, it is correct, but that was the tail end of an even worse episode. And again, there is this comparison to the 70s. By the way, I think the situation we're in today is very different from the 1970s, and I'll explain why. In the 70s, it was triggered from the supply side with first the Arab oil embargo in 1973 as a result of the, uh, the 1973 Arab-Israeli war. And then the price tripled, but it went from like $2 to $6. Okay. But, you know, percentage terms, that's a huge jump, but it was still $6. And then it got to 12 And then in 1979, you had a second oil embargo because of Iran and the Ayatollah and the revolution and the hostages and all that. And then it went from kind of 12 to 20. So oil went up by a factor of 10 in the course of the late seventies because of those two different embargoes. So that's coming from the supply side. But what happened was the other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where, you know, supplies choked off or there's an embargo or there's a shortage, of natural disaster, a lot of things. It's coming from the supply side and demand is inelastic. So you just pay up or, you know, kind of do without. But the demand side is much more psychological. That's called demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described. And as I said, I lived through the 70s um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today. I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So as that applies to today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course, they're related. You know, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? To get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Oh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. You get the food, you got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That requires diesel. The higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. But food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without, like it's going to get worse. Inflation's here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative for August of 2020 is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold it's just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10 year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. 
I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets, and I start my analysis in 1971. And I don't have to go through all all that data, but that's that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971 it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was $4.75. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, it was four, four pounds and, and change. And as late as World War I, say 1913, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to, you know, at the time Bombay, today Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. The British sovereign is it's about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce; it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today, what are you going to do with a one ounce coin? It's worth you know almost two thousand uh, dollars. You know, you're not going to use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be you know like a five hundred dollar bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time, and it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign, that's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971 when we decouple completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3,000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold. Um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Whether it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK, or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System sold all the banks. Hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and you know hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and it's there. And look on the, look in the assets and the first line item is gold certificate, and it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that $11 billion is actually worth $470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of $450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet, represented by a gold certificate. 
but it's not the gold. The treasury has the gold. And by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it and everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, I just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know what, if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hit it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously. In the U.S., we still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half, no, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. If I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it an ounce since 1980. Powell did not say, we're going to raise rates until core PC is 2%. He didn't say that. What he said was, we're going to raise rates until it's acting in a restrictive way on inflation and inflation will come down on its own because rates will be higher and high enough to cause that at which point we will we the fed will pause and and you say well when are you going to cut rates he was like the, the pause could be a year so there, you're talking tw forget this fed pivot nonsense i mean you're talking 2024 if then before they cut rates but in the meantime um so they've got to get rates high enough. So they're going to go, you know, well, 75 basis points in November, December, who knows? We'll, we'll know closer to the day. It'll either be 50 or 75, you know, some talk about 50, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it it's going up, probably going to go up. You know, I have the calendar for 2023. There's a meeting February 1st and another one in uh, late March, I think March 22nd. They'll probably raise up both of those. They're going to get rates up to five, five-ish. Um, at that point, they probably will have achieved the goal of bringing core PCE down, but they will also have destroyed the economy in the process. It's like I remember in, in Vietnam, the old saying, you know, we had to, we had to, this is uh, the latest and long string of uh, Fed blunders since uh, 1913, seems to be their specialty, but that's what they're doing. They, they could, uh, they could uh, at least pause now. Or maybe even cut rates. If 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 everything I said is correct, and obviously I think it is, or I wouldn't be saying it. But if we're on the verge of a global liquidity crisis, as revealed by the Eurodollar futures curve and the Treasury yield curve, and you know uh, negative swap spreads and uh, Treasury bill auctions with the yield of maturity below what the Fed will give you for a phone call, I mean, all those things are happening. That's hard data, uh, and it's a very very uh, troubling sign. Last seen in 2008, by the way, before the two, before the Lehman Brothers meltdown. If all that's happening and the fundamental signs are also weak, which we just saw in third quarter GDP, which is based on net exports, which won't last. How, how are you gonna drive a trade surplus with, with the strongest dollar in 20 years? Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. So with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? You know, when I, when I talked to my editor about this, you know, go back a year ago, so in November, 2021. You know, every headline you looked at, website, commentary, supply chain, supply chain, supply chain is breaking down. There's no, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they couldn't get cream cheese to make uh, make cheesecakes uh, at Junior's, you know, the world's world's most famous cheesecake place, um, you know, and on and on and on, like a, a long list. And then last spring was the, the baby formula shortage, which is actually was serious. I mean, mothers couldn't feed their children. So it was very bad. 
but I found some really, really interesting research that, uh, cause everyone says, well, yeah, COVID messed it up and the war in Ukraine messed it up. Well, that's true, but it didn't start there. This started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs because when, and I, I'm not here to debate the tariffs. I actually think the tariffs were a good idea, but that was the start of the supply chain breakdown because when Trump put tariffs on, started with, uh, appliances, you know, washing machines, refrigerators and stuff, and then solar panels, and then, you know, technology, and then they just kept piling on. But but you have to look at what China did in response. China, the U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. China is the world's largest importer of soybeans. Mm -hmm. China was buying all their soybeans from the United States just as a way to kind of make it, make it up a little bit. Like, well, we don't want, we got to buy the soybeans anyway. Why not buy them from the U.S. to keep the U.S.-China trade deficit under control so it doesn't become too politically toxic. Um, well, as soon as we Trump threw on the tariffs, China retaliated by moving their soybean uh, orders to Brazil, stop buying U.S. soybeans. Well, <laughs> that's not a phone call. I mean, you're talking about vessels, port facilities, uh, agriculture, you know, trucks. How do you get the soybeans to the ports? Uh, how many do you grow? Where's the fertilizer coming from? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those parties, you know, the shippers, the cargo, the insurance companies, and so many people involved, banks, letters of credit, it's just a lot involved. Um, they don't like short-term relationships. They say, okay, I'll do it. I want a five-year contract. And China said, okay. So they reconfigured all those transportation lanes to get the soybeans from Brazil. All of a sudden, you're a U.S. soybean grower. You say, well, what do I do? Well, we start selling them to the Netherlands because the Netherlands needs soybeans too. So now... But now instead of shipping them from like Port of LA to Ningbo and near Shanghai, we're shipping them from Port of Houston to, I don't know, uh, France or Marseille or someplace uh, or, or Rotterdam. So the point being, um, you completely scrambled all these uh, supply chain relationships and they break down. It's not, it's not that it's the end of the supply chain. So there's nothing new about supply chains. We can document to the Bronze Age. What was new beginning around 1989 was supply chain science. The combination of vastly improved computing power, artificial intelligence, new algorithms, and more sources of data that could be put together and used by experts to, to optimize and make the supply chains more efficient. That was new. And it kind of began with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, you know, Berlin Wall fell in 1989, Soviet Union uh, uh, dissolved uh, in 1991. I talked to the guy who, you know, like this is a worldwide endeavor, but he was probably the single most responsible individual for all the significant developments in the supply chain in the last 30 years. And he said to me, he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. We blew it up in three years. It's not gonna come back overnight. Mm -hmm. It's gonna take 10 years or more to rebuild it. And what I talk about in the book is supply chain 1.0, which is 1989 to 2019, and then supply chain 2.0, which kind of starts now, but is going to go indefinitely because it's going to take a long time to put this together. It's uh, you know, it's like dropping a vase and it breaks in a, a thousand pieces. You can't put it back together. You got to go buy a new vase, and that's what's going on with the supply chain. The, there will be a supply chain. There always is, but the new supply chain will look very different from what we've just come through because the whole the whole 30 years of period i'm describing was built on efficiency you know lower cost lower cost lower cost it was kind of the walmart model so yeah just in time inventory everyone knows about that but there's something called cross docking that's where a truck pulls up at a warehouse and you unload it and instead of putting the stuff in the warehouse you move it to another truck that then goes to a destination the stuff never goes in the warehouse inventories are very expensive they're they're they're, they're costly to finance you got to move the stuff around it's called picking you know pick the stuff off the shelf with your i used to drive a forklift so i know a little bit about it uh you know and put it on a truck you send a lot of trucks too so you know hey i've got seven suppliers why don't i cut it down to three and do bigger contracts with each one and get lower unit costs I've got five transportation lanes. Why don't I cut that down to two, get everything to you know Los Angeles and Seattle as the case may be, you know, et cetera. And they, they did it for three and they got costs lower, you know, and, and Walmart and Amazon were the champions of this, but everyone else was doing it, but they missed something. What they missed was that they're, while they were getting those unit, unit costs lower for consumers, they, there were hidden costs, and the main hidden cost was you, you were creating greater frailty. This whole system was subject to a massive, massive breakdown. So, uh, you know, what happens if you have two suppliers and they both go on strike? 
What happens if you have one port of entry and it's backlogged? What happens if you've got a uh, quest docking and warehouses and there aren't enough trucks? We need 80,000 drivers, 80,000 drivers. I wish they'd hire them instead of these IRS agents. But the point being, um, it, it is breaking down all across the board. Now, will it, it can it be put back together? Yes, but the biggest difference between 2.0 and 1.0, um, this goes by different names. Uh, you know, Johnny Ellen called it friendshoring and Macron called it a constellation of nations. Uh, I, I use the term a college of nations, you know, collegial club, if you will. So you'll still have trading partners, you'll still have outsourcing, you'll still have transportation lanes, but it'll be members only. It'll be basically democratic, kind of liberal republics, Western Europe, uh, you know, the EU, of course, uh, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, you know, and, and some others, India, we expect to be included, Fr friendly nations, but China's out. We're decoupling from them. They're decoupling from us. This isn't US driven. The US is participating, but this is what China wants too. Both sides are decoupling as fast as they can. China can develop its own network, you know, maybe Central Asian Republic, some Southeast Asian um you know suppliers and so forth but they're going to lose customers well most of their customers actually in in the united states we won't buy their stuff and we won't sell them our stuff particularly high tech stuff so you, the world's going to break and and these new clubs are going to be formed and there will be trade and there will be transportation lanes but it'll be much more restrictive now will prices be a little higher yes but it'll be more secure so the way i describe that you know, if you buy uh, insurance on your house or I buy insurance on my house, you don't want your house to burn down. You hope it doesn't. But if it does, you don't think your insurance premiums are a waste of money. Like when you write that check, you're like, that's money well spent. When you pay higher prices for consumer goods, the, the delta between the old price and the new price is your insurance premium for a more reliable system. And also, there's a big national security component to this. It's going to get worse. Inflation is here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative place to put money. You can buy gold, you can buy a 10 year treasury note. So what's been true since last summer is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10 year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets, and I start my analysis in 1971. And I don't have to go through all, the, all that data, but that's that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was 475. It could be off a little bit on that, but it was four, four pounds and, and change. And as late as World War I, say 1913, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to 
you know, at the time Bombay, today Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is it's about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce; it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today, what are you going to do with a one ounce coin that's worth you know almost two thousand uh, dollars? You know, you're not going to use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign? That's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971 when we decoupled completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3,000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Well, it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're, they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System sold all the banks. Hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and, you know, hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and it's there. And look on the, look in the assets. And the first line item is gold certificate. And it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that 11 billion is actually worth 470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion. that's not on the balance sheet represented by a gold certificate, but it's not the gold. The treasury has the gold. And by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, you know, I'm just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. 
Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hit it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously in the US. We still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. If I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it now since 1980. We're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. It's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks, and, and other asset classes. The largest, most sophisticated, biggest player, real money, market in the world is telling you that the Fed's going to blink, that they're going to raise rates, but then things are going to get so bad, they're going to have to cut rates. And that's why we can see a liquidity crisis and a very severe recession coming well in advance. I haven't really seen the real, the, the market collapse, the stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out, it'll get worse as the year goes on. Inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, if everything is great until February 27th and then Russia invades and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up, all right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This, this inflation goes back to uh, late 2021. It was persistent in the fall. We all remember the Fed and the Treasury saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And then finally, Nick J. Powell was testifying before Congress. He said, it's time to retire the word transitory. So that was his way of throwing in the towel. And Janet Yellen admitted she was mistaken also. This is going to be part of what throws the economy into a severe recession. They're raising rates and inflation's coming down. But what they don't know is, are interest rates coming down because they're raising rates? Or have they already hit the terminal rate and it's coming down on its own and they just don't know it? And that's a big deal because if they're at the terminal rate and they just don't know it and they keep tightening, which they are, they are going to over tighten, probably already have it. The energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, uh, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason uh, is not because Putin invaded Ukraine, it's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada, into the United States, where it would connect at a hub, uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada. And then we end up with you know, oil prices doubling or tripling, really from $40 to $120 in, in under a year. The other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation, that's where you know supplies choked off, or there's an embargo, or there's a shortage, there's a natural disaster. A lot of things. It's coming from the supply side, and demand is inelastic, so you just pay up or you know kind of do without. Um, but the demand side is much more psychological. That's called uh, demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described, and as I say, I lived through the seventies. Um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So inflation is coming down, no question. But is it because the Fed has continued to raise rates or is it because the Fed has hit a terminal rate and all they have to do is nothing, just pause, as they put it, and inflation will come down where they want? Uh, the market believes we're at the terminal rate. The Fed should just stop right now, leave it alone. Sooner than later, pivot to, uh, that's the new buzzword, pivot to rate cuts. And it's the anticipation of those rate cuts that has Wall Street all spun up. They get the pom-poms out and saying, buy stocks, buy tech, because the Fed's going to cut rates. The Fed does not see it that way at all. Um, 
the Fed says, um, yeah, we're raising rates, inflation's coming down, but we're not at the terminal rate. We'll kind of know when we see it, but they think it's probably five and a quarter. That's a very good estimate based on what the Fed has said themselves. I started my career uh, in banking in 1976. And uh, so I started, I remember my, uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking. And the inflation was so bad, you'd get a raise every like four or five months. And you didn't have to ask, they would just give it to you because they knew that you were gonna quit if, if, if uh, they didn't keep up. So she would get a raise and she was making more than I was at the time. So we'd go out to dinner and then I would get a raise and I was making more than she was. So we would just tease each other about that. But that's how it was. Um, and the psychology was, you know, if you needed a whatever, you know, TV set or refrigerator, new car, whatever you say, I better buy it now because the price is going to be higher. If I wait a month or two months, the price is going to run away from me. So it, it had huge behavioral uh, effects between 77 and 81. So that five year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power, not 15, 50. During the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time. But it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, or buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of the depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not gonna spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course they're related. You know, it's like, oh, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You, to get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Oh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food, you got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That, requires diesel, the higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. Um, but, but food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So, so you have that, um, that, that cost push inflation. We're not quite at the stage where it's demand pull. We're not quite at the stage where individual consumers are behaving the way I described in the 1970s saying, hey, better better spend the money fast because it's it's losing value. This damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and in inflation in the U.S. has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd, uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer to electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now that's another fantasy. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the US economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen.